We acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional custodians of the continent, whose culture is the oldest living culture in human history. We pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and we respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. They share the memories, traditions and hopes of the traditional ancestors with the new generation today and in the future. We would also like to thank them for looking after this land for thousands of years. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully some of you have been in the sessions throughout today. Um, if not, you will be able to catch up on all of the recordings as well. So if you haven't met me in one of the sessions so far, my name's Karen from Australian Environmental Education and also Virtual Excursions Australia. So during um, our special live events, we always like to end with a professional development session to really help teachers um, follow up on some of the learnings that their students have had and how they might want to be able to uh, use that and embed that in their programming um, throughout the year and planning for uh, next year as well. So we've got um, Shona from uh, Geoscience Australia with us today, Ben from Physics Education, uh, Liana from Sydney Olympic Park. Um, I will share the screen with them at the moment and we will spend a little bit of time um, answering questions, but also, um, and we've got Danielle Lego as well. Where are we? Oh, I've lost, lost all my buttons. Maybe that's all I can put on the shared screen just for now. Um, so oh. each, each organisation will be able to go through and talk a little bit more specifically about what they can do to help you uh, look at earth science. But we might just start off with a little bit of, a, you know, what Earth Science Week um, means to us and our organisations and why we actually join forces together to, um, to put on events and programs like this in the first place. Okay, not a problem. Um, we might just get Graeme, if you can um, un, um, do the camera for Danielle Lego, that would be great. Um, excellent. So I'm just going to go on um, mute at the moment and I'll let the others start with their um, Earth Science Week story. always wonder who's going to talk first, right? So I'll kick it off. Hi, uh, love to be involved with Earth Science Week. A uh, long time ago, I actually trained in earth and environmental sciences. So this is very much down my alley. I love how it really does connect um, all sorts of different areas of science all in one go. And I really hope that you have had a fantastic time during this Earth Science Week. Uh, uh, Shona, what are your thoughts? Well, look, Geoscience Australia has had a really long history associated with Earth Science Week. And in fact, Earth, Earth Science Week, like sometimes people complain, oh goodness, it's the wrong time of year for us in Australia because the dates actually come out of the US. And if you ever go to the American site for Earth Science Week, there's massive amounts of resources, but of course they're American centric. So GA for a long time was part of Earth Science Week and wanted to nudge it on again. It's fallen into the doldrums, but now there's a new push by our chief scientist for us to be more heavily involved. So we've got a new quiz, we've got some new activities, um, lots of things that got curtailed by the current shutdown as well. But we really want everybody to think about next year, in a, this time next year, what might you be doing in your classrooms and elsewhere? Liana. Um, yeah, so I guess at Sydney Olympic Park, we do a lot of um, excursions and virtual excursions and we're keen to just help people, help teachers, um, you know, implement different um, excursions and things that they can, they might want to be a part of. We also do virtual excursions and uh, even, even customised excursions as well. So what would you like to add to that, Dan? Uh, yeah, thanks, Liana. Um, yeah, just that we are um, based in Sydney Olympic Park and um, we have a world of uh, different natural environments um, right at our fingertips that the students can engage with and uh, that's based around, uh, around water um, and around ecology 
Um, also around our built environments um, with sustainable development as well. And uh, look, if we're talking about the geosciences and talking about geology, um, we also have some uh, wonderful uh, um, uh, cuttings through the old brickworks brick pit as well that students can have a look at um, all the geological history over time um, in that space as well. So yeah, so we just have uh, school excursions at the park. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Danielle. And I will add from my perspective, I'm your student, um, you know, that was really interested in rocks as a kid. So I'm, the, I'm that kid that you might have that's always bringing rocks to school. It's always asking about volcanoes, um, you know, likes to make mess with water and mud outside. Um, and, you know, today is a little bit of how you can help a kid like me when I was going through school, you know, be, continue that passion. Um, a lot of what we spoke about in the sessions is things that, you know, your students are interested in now can well be the, the thing that they take through um, to their career at the end point. You know, my rock collection started when I was four and I haven't stopped since. So, you know, think about it from that perspective of the things that you were passionate about as a, a student as well and what you would have loved a teacher or a teacher may have, have helped support that. Um, so this is some of the things that we're, you know, thinking of those fun things that you can do to help those kids that, you know, sometimes may struggle in other areas, but really have a passion for sort of those earth science and what's going on in the natural world around them and what's going on underneath their feet. So um, that's where I really bring my um, earth science journey. And um, I look after, well, I, I started a business a couple of years ago called Australian Environmental Education. And it is specifically designed to help support you and your students uh, looking at both earth science and also sort of uh, natural sciences. So I'll be able to share links later on that have have lots of really um, appropriately aged resources that you can use just to be a step ahead of your kids. If it's anything to do with dinosaurs, don't even try to stay ahead of them. They know more than you and that's okay. Um, but for other areas, it's things that you can share with your kids. It can just be that beginning point um, to help them get excited in earth science um, if that's the direction that they'd like to go. Um, excellent. So we might start off just to see if you wanted to put any questions in the Q&A. So if there's something you're really interested about, maybe you can put in whether you're a primary or a secondary teacher, that would be really helpful for us to know, um, you know, what kind of content we can share with you. Um, and also if there's a specific area looking at earth science that you might be interested in, in us covering today. Um, the theme for this year is water. Um, so that's why one of the reasons we you know, did some sessions on water today and especially why I thought it would be great to have the team from Sydney Olympic Park in our session for us today because they do lots about the environment and how sort of the, you know, it all links together with the uh, geology as well. Um, okay, I did see someone raise their hand, but you might need to put the question in the Q&A for us to, um, to answer. Um, while we're waiting for that, I'll just uh, let you know what will be happening later on um, through the session as well. It is recorded, so we will be able to share it with you later. And we are collating a whole host of resources that have come out of all of the sessions today and will come out of um, the, the session this afternoon that we'll be able to share with you in an email this afternoon. So some of us will put um, links in the chat. That's fine. If you don't get a chance to copy them, we will absolutely share um, those with you at the end. So I'm collating a, a nice big email with evaluation, the links to all of the YouTube clips of all of the sessions and all of the really useful resources for your students, but also for you. Um, so we've got a couple of homeschoolers here. Um, and great to, to be included in the, um, the questions as well. So, yeah, it's, um, it really is it pretty much so many of us at the moment across New South Wales have, have appreciated what um, people um, homeschooling uh, have been doing for, for so long. So a lot of the programs and, um, that we develop and resources are available for kids learning at home, kids learning in the classroom, um, homeschool um, groups as well, because it, we want everyone to have the same opportunities to connect to these resources. That's why some of the great um, recordings and online um, links will be really useful. Okay, so another one. Yep, primary school teacher. Some people have done lots of access uh, programs at Sydney Olympic Park. That's always um, good to see as well. 
Um, okay, so we might start, I'm just going to follow a little bit of the same order that we had uh, with the sessions today. So we might start with Geoscience Australia, just to go into a little bit more detail, we'll unspotlight everyone else, you can take centre stage and just show some of the amazing um, resources that you have available for, for teachers across um, New South Wales and beyond. Thanks, Karen. I'll just share my screen and hopefully it'll be the right screen, which it's not, I'm guessing. Sorry. Are you seeing my screen, the presentation? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So um, it was interesting when I saw how the wording you used, embedding earth sciences in your teaching, because bedding is the name that we have for layers of rock. So that's quite appropriate there. Um, this is where I normally should be working. This is Geoscience Australia. It's an organization in Canberra where you've got geologists and geographers working on all sorts of information for the good of the whole country. And there's more than 600 people that work in the building. We are the education team, just a little part of that. So we have an education center. We have a public foyer space mini museum, which is all part of our education visits that you'll see. But I'm at home now. Um, we're shut down like so many other plate people and places. But what I thought I'd do was actually tell you a bit more about that program, which will lead into some ideas that might work for in the classroom as well. We've got lots of education delivery. So many teachers from Sydney and around the state and beyond may have brought their students to see us as part of the Canberra camp. The Canberra camps are really going to kick off again next year. We're open for bookings now for the next two years ahead. So one of the things that happens is the small venues we get full. So think ahead, please. But professional learning, education resources will come to late, which is really exciting for us this week. So some of our core business is, is this building teacher confidence and knowledge in earth science. We recognize that of all the sciences, often earth science is the one that the teachers feel least confident in. And we want to boost that confidence and help you with that. Normally we'd be doing some of that face to face, but we have to go different ways these days. Now, when kids come to visit us, there's a few things that you might want to think about doing in your classrooms as well that we do. We have these sediment columns and we add a layer of sediment, be it sand or broken shells or something like that for every school group that visits us. And it's a fantastic way to start to link to how the history of the earth is recorded in the rocks and how the rocks get older as you go down and links to formation of sedimentary rocks. But you can do a miniature version in the classroom with a jam jar or a passata jar, get a layer from every kid's garden or local park or something like that, um, and have that as a way of recording and linking into rocks and earth history. Lots of hands-on that we'll come back to, having the um, samples all around the room, making earthquakes with kids. We've got a big seismograph, but there's all sorts of um, digital versions on phones that you can use to do that as well. We get to access the collection in the foyer, which is fantastic, our seismographs there. And even in the top right, you'll see there's a, a little piece of black rock, which is a piece of basalt that was brought back from the moon by the Apollo 17 mission. And you can touch it. It's the only piece of touchstone earth, uh, sorry, moon rock on display in the Southern hemisphere. So that's something really special that we have at the moment, but you can't go and see it yet. Next year, next year. Outdoors, we've got a walk through time as well, a geological time walk, where you've got information plaques leading through the whole history of the Earth and what happened at different stages when oxygen started to be in the atmosphere. And we've got rocks along there as well. Rocks like these great big um, volcanic bombs from West Victoria. They only erupted maybe 25,000 years ago. And you might think, well, I can't do that myself. But you can, because all of the plaques, the prints of the plaques can be taken off our website and set out in your own grounds. You can create your own geological time walk at different scales for yourselves. There's this repeating, repeated theme of scale that comes into things, and that might be something you want to use as well. Our geological time scale that we have on the side of a bench in the education center, there's a printed version that you can download as well and set your own one up. Big numbers come into scale. The big megafauna images that we have here. Now, we don't have a downloadable version of that, but that's a two-scale diprotodon that the kids can stand next to. And we've got our two-scale cross-section through the earth because we're often dealing with things that are so large, students can't really imagine them easily. And there's the traditional activity with the toilet roll time scale and working out sort of what fitted when and where in the earth's history. 
hands-on is the way to go. Absolutely. We've got rocks getting picked up all the time in the Ed Centre. Having a collection, we'll talk about that more, to, to have the kids hold is, is um, so important. Um, you might be surprised that in my many, many years at the centre, not one child has dropped a rock on their toe. You think that's going to be the most obvious thing. Nothing, it's never actually happened. Um, at a pl tectonic plates puzzle, there's a downloadable version of that that you can get students or yourselves to cut out. Magnification works so well in earth science. Hand lenses, magnifiers, microscopes work really well for sand, sediments, rocks as well. And they're actually really, really important and is what real geologists use too. By the way, that globe with the segment that comes out, ridiculously popular with kids and readily available. You just take this piece out and it's like, ooh, um, it, that's with our sort of upper primary kids in particular. Popular culture, the Minecraft phenomena, you cannot ignore it whenever you're talking about rocks and earth science. It's been incredible. We thought it would fade and it still hasn't. Lots of kids are learning earth science through Minecraft with its mistakes and foibles as well. So we set up, we've made one poster and then a second poster, all available online that you can use that help to sort of bust some of the myths there. We need a new disaster movie. San Andreas is getting a bit old, but great for linking to earthquakes and that sort of thing. Um, you know, like what's correct in the movie or what's not correct in the movie, but it's great to conversation starter. We're closed, can't come and visit us, which has really put the emphasis onto the online side of things. There's a big suite of resources there already. Loads of things to download, books, bookmarks about geological time, sediment analysis cards, which I might come back to a little bit later on, a whole range of posters. There's cutouts. Please, please, please do not inflict these cutouts on young children. They are not easy not the fossil ones at least, but there's um, volcanoes as well, there's landslides, there's the Sydney Basin for the Sydney region area as well. Um, a whole load of booklets. So if you're going, I really have got no idea what's the difference between weathering and erosion, we've got a whole booklet about it. It's aimed at secondary level, but for primary teachers, it gives you all the foundations you need and all the booklets have got um, student activities with them as well. Curriculum links all the way through you know, I'm guessing that a lot of you might be primary teachers who are doing middle primary and upper primary, and those links are really, really strong, but they're in the secondary as well. We have videos that we made last year and are an ongoing endeavour because these poor kids were missing out on coming to visit us. So we potted bits of what we would do with them normally in the education centre. So you've got a five minutes introduction to plate tectonics video with me talking straight to the camera and other members of the team. And then we expanded to going behind the scenes. So the video about the Earth National Earthquake Centre shows you behind the scenes, which you can't take kids to see properly because they're not able to. And we've got a new video coming really soon. We're starting to sting up the scientists to talk as if they were talking to students and talking about their passions. So one of our marine scientists has got an upcoming little short webinar, about 15, 20 minutes, about how we understand the shape of the seafloor and marine life that she loves down there. So, and we're gonna get a few more of those going as well. Home activities for Earth Science Week added to this list, great for the homeschoolers, but also for any of the teachers in the classroom. Edible Earth Science, everybody talks about things like Mars bars. There's so many things that are possible. You don't have to be a great baker. Um, and we've created a whole set of links for that. There's also how to make your own fossil and how to make your own rock. A um, couple of weeks ago, this was my whole weekend. And Plaster of Paris wins, absolutely wins hands down. Get the Plaster of Paris out and you can make these really, really well. There's also, I know, Karen, you've got a um, quiz going on later in this afternoon. We have a different quiz that you can link to through our Earth Science Week page about being a geoscience genius uh, on the quizzes platform. Hazards resources galore. Community safety is core business for Geoscience Australia. So there's a whole range of resources that support that. Um, the Tsunami, the ultimate guide, actually came from Surf Life Saving Australia and Geoscience Australia contributed a lot to it. So the plate tectonics cutout is there, all sorts of things. Find your dead tennis balls to attach a globe to. Um, the bouncy ones are a nightmare, but the dead ones work better. Um, recorded sessions for teachers. So if you're feeling inspired by what you see today and want to know more, some of our sessions are recorded, they're available online. So you can get a 45 minute session all about teaching middle primary 
about slow changes to the Earth's surface, weathering and erosion, and some of the activities and experiments that you can do. There's another one about teaching the upper primary. The other ones there are the second half are about plate tectonic myths and more focused on the secondary level. Websites, the place to go. If you get lost and can't find something you're looking for, just contact us, but the website's the way to go. And I'll highlight that we've got education updates. It's a newsletter that comes out about six times a year, but you, it's just easy to click on that and you can subscribe to it and you'll find out about what's, what's going on and coming up and any new resources that are coming out. So going back to what you can do, and I was thinking about this embedding earth science in your lessons and in your classroom teaching. First of all, you're here, you're in a professional learning session, fantastic. As Karen said, be a collector. This is so important, being out and about and you, when you're on holiday or when you're doing things, having things there that you can then call on and use in your lessons when that comes around. Can I point out, and can you see this with the blur on? Yeah, river pebbles, horrible, I'm sorry horrible because for a geologist you want to be able to look at a rock at its fresh surface that means that you might need to smash it open and these rounded pebble surfaces are really difficult weathered rocks that brown weathered surface horrible don't use it what you want is a nice fresh surface so that's why the hammer comes in useful safely used and you can then see well have i got a rock which is made of crystals have i got a rock which has got layers in it have those layers possibly even been bent and folded like this one? Or have I got a rock that might have a fossil in it like this? Maybe you go and pick up a rock that looks a bit dull like this and turn it over and find that it's got loads of crystals in it like this. That idea of a nature table tends to be dominated by, logical, by biological specimens, but add your geological specimens. Um, and also don't forget sand, sand from a river, sand from a beach. They are completely different. And under the microscope, your students can see rounded grains versus less rounded grains, the variety of grains. So collect sand wherever you go, where you are allowed to, always collect where you are allowed to as well. Please, please, please don't neglect earth science in the curriculum. It happens a lot anecdotally, especially when teachers don't feel confident. Um, when the uh, middle primary curriculum came in teaching more about weathering and erosion and those sort of topics, teachers were very daunted. The kids loved it. And it's actually the teachers are having to do catch up. So don't let the earth science be squeezed out. Use your environmental print opportunities, maps, bright maps, that sort of thing. In this case, the Minecraft poster, Talk to your students about where things come from because earth science is all around us and our usage of resources from the earth are all around us. Where does this gravel come from for the railway? Where does the tarmac come from for the road? Where does the clay come from for the bricks? Where's the aluminium from for the windows and our buildings? All around us, not to mention water, which is of course the main topic of, of, of the day. So talk to students about that. Um, and I was gonna add integrate because these topics we're calling earth science, a lot of them cross over into geography, especially hazards, mapping, that sort of thing crosses over really strongly, links to maths, English, primary connections topics. It all works really, really well. So love the earth sciences. And I just wanted to show some diversity of work these days, because even at primary level, you know, well, what does an earth scientist look like? Well, it might be a drone pilot getting information about some remote place or flying over a volcano like the drones that got eaten up by the Iceland eruption earlier this year. It might be making maps in the office, but it might be cyclone hazard or earthquake hazard. It might be getting information from satellites that is telling us about changes to the surface of the earth. It might be lab work. It's the only picture with a lab coat on. It might be looking at rock samples like this drill core. It might be out doing field work and mapping of all sorts of things, be it soils, be it rocks, anything. So it's a earth science, geoscience. It's a really, really diverse field of work, field of study, and it applies all the other sciences in one way or another. So it's a great way to integrate with other sciences. So that's my bit of a formal presentation. So happy Earth Science Week. And that's the, that's the links. Email link there if you need to talk to one of our team. And this is the website where you'll find all those resources. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. And we've had a couple of questions. Um, 
regarding um, getting access to those links. So I think um, I'll be sharing them out in a big email at the end um, and you'll be able to have access to that, to that for yourself and also to be able to share with your students as well. Um, I have to say, I have been using Geoscience Australia resources for my entire adult life. So when I was at the Australian Museum, we also we used to have the bookmarks of the timeline. Yes. We'd give out. Um, I share links to the plate tectonics activities in my sessions. Um, even now, the Minecraft posters were an absolute stroke of genius um, mm -hmm. because every time I do a session, I'm always getting every kid now knows what obsidian is. Um, so it's great to have those posters to actually go through the real geology of some of the, the objects that they know um, from playing Minecraft. So, you know, there are lots of different ways where your students are having access to, to earth science and being able to capitalise on that um, is great. And I love some of your ideas about um, students bringing in little bits of soil mm. from their backyards to make that. I love that from, you know, sort of an environmental perspective as well about getting kids to think about what's growing in their backyards by what the types of soil and the geology is. Oh, there's so many different directions you can go with an activity. So I, I, I absolutely uh, love that one as well. Um, I, haven't, I haven't even mentioned how you can use sugar cubes to represent making those darn rounded river pebbles as well. <laughs> Um, so that's what's so great about, um, you know, coming along to the session here this afternoon, that you're just going to, um, you know, get the beginning of some ideas. You can help really engage your students um, with these activities and they will absolutely be fun and very exciting. So thank you so much. I'm just going to pass over to Sydney Olympic Park now and um, they will be sharing some of their uh, content. Well, remember, if you do have questions, uh, just pop them in the Q&A and we will um, go through them as well. Excellent. Thanks, Danielle and Liana. Uh, thanks, Karen. That's wonderful. I'm just going to share my screen now and Liana and I will um, speak about what we do at Sydney Olympic Park. And um, really, that is a lot of focus around uh, water. And um, what Liana and I are going to do today is tell you all about what we have to offer at the park. So we have uh, 22 curriculum linked school excursions uh, from kindy to year 12 that we run on site at Sydney Olympic Park. Um, they are in geography, science with the primary schools, it's geography, science, history, um, and our um, Indigenous culture programs as well. Um, all of our programs that we run at the park, all of the field work that we do is hands-on. Um, it's based outdoors, in the park, in the natural environments, as well as the built environments at the park. And it does feature around sustainability um, for both the built and the natural environments. So um, today, in coming into this session, uh, Karen let us know that it was, uh, it was about water and um, our park and the development of our park and the history of our park um, goes back a long way and is related to water. So um, we have a long history um, and a colourful history as well um, on the site at Sydney Olympic Park. We are on Wongal country and um, the Wongal people used the waterways um, that surrounds Sydney Olympic, what is now called Sydney Olympic Park, um, for natural resources and get, getting um, around the place um, from in uh, around Darawal country all the way out to Darug country. Um, and that was the Parramatta Powell's Creek and Haslam's Creek. Um, these creeks still remain today. However, they are very much changed. And that is sometimes the topic of our excursion programs, how humans have actually impacted on the waterways around Sydney Olympic Park. So the slide that we can see here on the left-hand side, um, this is the development of the Olympic site back in the 1990s. Um, and what you can see here is the suburb of Newington and to the right hand side of the left slide is the um, is Sydney Olympic Park, the actual Olympic site itself. 
Now, that was um, just a little bit of a, a background around how water became so important at the site is that we, as we engineered, we completely built the site. And as we engineered the site, we actually tried to mimic the natural water cycle that would happen in nature. But here we have a completely urbanised and built environment. So what we had to do when we were engineering the site, we had to think about what is it that nature does with water? What is the natural water cycle? We have to look at infiltration. We have to look at runoff. We have to look at our permeable surfaces. We have to look at mini catchments. And then we also have to have a look at how do the waterways support ecological, um, have to support um, uh, nature and, and um, ecological life. So um, what we did was we created, you'll see on this next slide here, we created a whole range of different water bodies within Sydney Olympic Park um, so that we could have not just a sustainable environment for our, um, our wildlife, but also an environment that would capture a lot of the runoff that would come from an urban area. So we designed a whole range of different water bodies that would capture water as it flowed across the park that would clean the water as well with, um, with reeds and take up the excess nutrients and also provide um, a recreational facilities and, um, and, and uh, areas for our native wildlife and our water birds. So they're just a few images there in the park of our constructed waterways. What we also had to do when um, we were developing the park was think about sustainable use of water. So not only were we trying to mimic a natural water cycle, but what we also wanted to do was not waste our own potable water. So we implemented what's called the RAM system, W-R-A-M-S, which is a water reclamation and management scheme. And at the time, it was actually the largest um, urban water recycling system in Australia. What it does is it, it, it captures um, runoff, rainwater, as well as um, uh, uh, treated primary effluent. It sends it to a water treatment plant that is actually on site. And if you have a look at that circle there um, on my slide, you'll see down the bottom, that's the water treatment plant. And that's where the water actually gets um, pushed through a filtration process. And then that water gets sent back out to all of our facilities at Sydney Olympic Park and all of the uh, urban development that is now at Sydney Olympic Park and that recycled water can be used for toilet flushing, it can be used in laundries, uh, it can be used also for irrigation and around the park for some uh, water features as well. So that's a really important story within um, the park itself. And it saves at the moment close to a billion litres of Sydney's drinking water every year. So we're not flushing Sydney's drinking water when we flush the toilet out there at Sydney Olympic Park. If you come out for an event or if you live on site um, or you come out and you use a, one of the public facilities, you're actually flushing recycled water. And that is a, that is a really um, good news story for the park itself. Um, when students come to the park for their school excursions, they actually get to walk around the water, the urban water cycle and have a look at the flow of water and how we utilise it throughout the park. So the students all, as I mentioned before, it's really hands on work. Um, they get to test the water um, and they get to draw field sketches in a large brick pit, which is now repurposed as a water reservoir for the water recycling system. Um, and that also sits on top of, or stands on top of a whole range or a whole system of very highly managed green and golden bell frog 
um, ponds as well. So this is one of the, the main breeding uh, grounds for the endangered green and golden bell frog at Sydney Olympic Park. They also get to see what the ecologists are doing around the park in terms of uh, creating frog ponds in different areas around the park for inc increasing the breeding of the green and golden bell frog, as well as improving the ponds, uh, both natural and man-made, for use uh, by our water birds who live on site. These are some of the other um, aspects of our um, engineered water um, sensitive urban design around the site that the students will get to learn about on the day. So one of the ways in which we can mimic the natural water cycle is by having permeable paving. And if you have a look, I've got four um, images there from left to right. It's the third from the left is our permeable paving. So if any of you have been to Sydney Olympic Park, you know it's a huge, it's a vast area that holds a lot of major events. And so we've got a lot of paving. Now, everybody would think that that would cause a huge amount of runoff. And that would cause a problem for our local waterways, getting a lot of rubbish in them um, from all the people that are on site as it, when it rains, all going down into our creeks and ponds. But what happens is a lot of that water actually permeates down through these permeable pavers. So they are laid so that there is a small gap in between them and the rainwater can seep down and naturally infiltrate the earth's surface. Um, so that's just one aspect of water sensitive urban design that we've implemented. On the far left hand side of the screen, that is a rainwater garden. So we've got a number of these that run from our stormwater drains down and into our um, local ponds and creeks. What it does is the water flows through there when it rains and all of those reeds and plants slow the water down they allow it to then filtrate down into the sediment and the plants also take up the excess nutrients and they also trap any of the floating rubbish. Like you can imagine water bottles and, and plastic um, wrappers, like chip packets and things like that. They trap that and then that can be collected. So it's kind of like having a rubbish bin or a, or a filter um, for the water as it runs off our site and down into the local waterways. Now, the second uh, image from the left is our um, permeable gutters. And our streets are actually designed to have the water either flow into the, into the center of the street and get collected in the stormwater drain or flow to the edge of the street out towards our gutters. And then from there, it filters into our rainwater gardens. So um, it's another way of capturing our stormwater and cleaning it before it ends up in our stormwater um, canals and into our ponds and rivers. And on the far right hand side, you can see um, our lovely tree there with a grate around it. And that grate enables the rainwater to filter down and into the roots of the plant. So again, they are the four different ways that we are able to create um, a almost a natural water cycle in a very heavily urbanised environment. And the students get to see this as they walk around on the day. They get to pour their water bottles down onto the paving and see it seep away instead of run off and, um, and walk along the edges of these uh, rainwater gardens and, and see everything. They also get to do... Um, do some sketches as well. Um, so just before I hand over to Liana, I'd just like to mention that all of our resources for primary and secondary school excursions on site can be found on our website. And I know that Karen is going to be sending you a link, um, which links to our website. We also have resources on our Park Live our web page, and that's a whole range of videos that will take you through a, a variety of um, wetlands and natural environments at Sydney Olympic Park. And linked to those videos are um, also a range of worksheets. 
that students can use, whether they're at home or at school. We've also got a range of um, fieldwork technique videos on our resource page. And we've also got a whole range of resources that we can provide to you um, as you're preparing for a school excursion to Sydney Olympic Park. We can also customise anything that you would like to have customised um, that links in with your school programs as well. So we do have 22 programs that you can find all on our website. Um, and uh, I will now hand over to Liana to go specifically through our primary school programs. Thanks, Liana. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, so um, Danielle's kind of talked about um, particularly our urban areas and um, I'm going to talk more about our natural wetlands, uh, specifically um, the Bardu mangroves. Um, so, so water, as Danielle said, water is central to everything, pretty much everything we do here at Sydney Olympic Park. Um, both the, the built waterways, like Danielle's mentioned, and these and the natural waterways. Um, so yeah, it's no surprise that pretty much I think all of our programs have a strong focus on water because it's one of the biggest assets we have here at Sydney Olympic Park. Um, now Danielle con is controlling the slides, so I'm going to have to say next. <laughs> As you can see, um, these are our Bardia mangroves. And um, we have this wonderful um, boardwalk, uh, which is actually made out of recycled plastic um, that runs through our, our mangroves. Uh, so the students, when they come here, are fully immersed in nature um, and are, are at a beautiful, a, a nice level to see everything. Um, so, and they even get to, as you can see in this picture, they everything's hands-on. They get to touch, smell, and sometimes even taste the mangroves. Uh, we do get them to lick leaves. Um, and most of the time they're pleasantly surprised at the taste. <laughs> um, and yeah, everything is hands-on, particularly our primary school programs. I think only one of our stage three programs has a worksheet, uh, which is just for data gathering. Um, and that's because we want the primary school students when they come on site to be as hands-on as possible, to not be worrying about worksheets. Um, the student you can see on the picture here is she's either lead, reaching out, touching a, a new metaphor, which is a mangrove root, or maybe she's picking up a snail. Um, but you can see they get very up close and personal um, off of our boardwalk. What you can't see is this student isn't actually standing in mud. Uh, she's leaning off the edge of our boardwalk. So we've got some good places along our boardwalk as well. Um, and we have an amazing food web, a nat natural food webs at Sydney Lake Park. Again, trying to get up close and personal as much as as much as we can and showing students um, animals and insects in the natural environment even the scary ones like spiders um, and and students get to learn um, while seeing those animals in person um, why are they important why are those animals important why should we care about the golden orb weaving spider that you can see on the left why should we care about the tiny little mangrove snail that you can see the student holding on the right so yeah, um, and also in the middle picture there, that's a process called dip netting, um, which is scooping for uh, freshwater bugs. So again, everything is is hands on, and and particularly, what what do these animals teach us about the environment and the quality of the of the water, um, and what are some impacts that are surrounding these wetlands that might be decreasing the quality of the water? So students um, learn all that whilst being hands-on. What we can see here are actually images from our water bird refuge. Um, and the top right image is a constructed island. Um, so Sydney Olympic Park is an area that has been heavily degraded over time in the past uh, by human impacts. And so it's a very heavily managed site, um, but it is still a very important and globally important site uh, around the world. Um, particularly our mangroves and our water bird refuge, which you can see there. And it's called the water bird refuge because it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a refuge specifically for, or particularly for migratory birds. So birds that fly from overseas, thousands and thousands of kilometers of flying 
and they need to have somewhere to breed and feed. And so our waterbed refuge is another, another wetland that we take students to. And they get to learn about how we manage the wetlands and why they need managing by humans now. Um, you know, what's happened in the past and how we can learn from that. And they also get to do a bit of bird watching, as you can see here. Uh, so we've got bird hides uh, and bird screens. Students get to use binoculars um, and they do some bird watching. Again, that helps to discover whether or not the wetlands are being managed um, to be healthy enough to support the bird life that needs to live there. Um, because it's one of those places for migratory birds, if you, if you take away a habitat that they're used to coming to, they'll still come back to that same habitat, even if there's a building there. Um, plovers and magpies, things like that in our, in our suburbs is a good example of that. So, but if we remove the, the wetlands, they'll have nowhere to go and they'll unfortunately um, become extinct and die out. So, yeah. And these are the, the green and golden bell frogs that Danielle was talking about. Um, that is a, our endangered species, which was found on site whilst the uh, in our disused brick pit. And um, so to help manage them, uh, we've built in the top right corner there, you can see that looks like a little kind of filthy pool. <laughs> but it's actually a, a constructed uh, freshwater pond for the green and golden bell frogs. Um, so they, they live in our brick pit, which is the big hole in the ground uh, with water, but we do give them more little secluded ponds as well. So they have more habitat. And if you ever drive around Sydney Olympic Park, you might see lots of black mesh along the fences everywhere. Um, and that has a few um, uses, one of which is to keep the frogs away from the road and stop them from getting squished. Uh, but also to keep out feral um, animals like uh, cats and foxes and things like that that might um, eat them. So, yes, yeah, students get to see the, all this kind of stuff. And as Danielle mentioned, we do have rich cultural uh, experiences, cultural programs uh, in our wetlands. Um, and we have, a, we have a, our, I think we've got three Indigenous programs, which were written by Shannon Foster, who's the lady in the bottom right corner there. And she's a, salt, a Darawal saltwater knowledge keeper. And we also have um, some Indigenous education officers on our team and our other education officers who are non-Indigenous have been, have been trained and, and have been given guidance on how to um, respectfully uh, deliver this information as well um, to the students and how the, how the mangroves in particular really important to the Wonga people who live there um, and the uses of the of the wetlands uh, as well. So I think that's all. And Stania, you've got anything else to add? And yeah, if you have any questions, continue to put them into the chat and I will answer them as we continue on as well. So thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you both. Um, we did have um, a, a, someone wondering when you might be back open. So um, opened for general visitation, of course, but um, when you might be back open for um, excursions and those kinds of programs. Um, so we'll be open for on-site excursions as of term one next year. Um, and we are offering virtual excursions from late November. So we actually have the Youth Eco Summit event uh, taking place from the 8th um, through to the 12th. Uh, and then we have a couple of weeks there at the end of November for virtual excursions and mid-December as well. Excellent. But if you are a homeschool group in Sydney or um, just a, a visitor, you, you can go to Sydney Olympic Park as an open venue. You just won't have educator-led um, programs. So if you did want to explore the wetlands or, um, you know, have a look at some of those amazing um, uh, water-sensitive urban design features, you can actually do that as individual families or homeschool groups. So um, just on that note, Karen, uh, we do actually have virtual tours. We have a tour app and I can send you the link for that. Um, so that sends you around and gives you a whole range of information um, of different areas of the park. I think we've got about five tours now. One of them is specifically through the wetlands. 
Excellent. Well, that's a great idea. I will share that with everyone as well. Um, excellent. Well, we saw some really lovely um, experiments that Rusty did for us um, looking at working with water and the properties of water um, earlier today. So um, Ben and Rusty, what have you got to share with us now? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Actually, definitely. Um, I know Rusty really does a great job doing presentation. He was like, you know what, we're just grabbing a headlock and uh, get him to do a bit, little bit more this afternoon. That's definitely going to happen. But what I thought is just to show you briefly uh, what physics education gets up to, what the resources are available online, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, and also, it's a bit of a massive website, which means sometimes you can get lost in it. So I thought rather than just some slides, I might just, just go through our so uh, website itself and show you... Uh, really where that might be able to help be helpful. So I'm going to go over to here. So when you go to physics education, spelled really badly, F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S, you'll land on the main page here. And if you want to look through, you can go, if you're a school, you can click on that. Or if you're looking for free things, you can go here. Alternatively, you can also click up the top here and click on where it says free resources and find the free things that you want. Or alternatively, you can click on programs and take you through to schools. Now, I know that we've got some um, homeschoolers here. We've got some primary school teachers here, as well as potentially some um, secondary. So, so one of the things that does come up is because if you click on, just say, take the schools and you find yourself at the primary school uh, science area, you're really looking at over 45 programs, which means it's kind of not great to search for because there's, there's just so many different programs. So what I do recommend doing is if you search by curriculum, and in this case, we're talking earth and space today. So why not? Let's, let's talk on earth and space. If you just click on that, it automatically filters out what's on the site. It takes a little bit of time, but top pops on up. Now, if you want to get a little bit further into that, you could also choose by, hey, I'm in New South Wales, because it actually matters to which kits are in which state, because we do outreach to hundreds of schools every year. And perhaps that you're teaching a very particular year group. So I'm just going to choose year four, just for the sake of it. So year four. So well, it filters out some of the high school stuff, gets rid of the stuff that's for kindy. So year four only, Earth and Space, New South Wales, what can I get? So there are definitely programs available. So I'm just going to click on a random one. So I think disasters, why not? So click on read more. It'll then uh, boot on up. So up on goes. Uh, it'll also indicate whether it's available online. And a lot of our programs are available online, but it will take you through what will happen is there an online thing? And yes, in this case, there is. Uh, pretty pictures followed by the curriculum mapping, very important. In fact, if you do click through onto these links here, it actually takes you to the mapping of all our programs uh, and then goes into actually what happens. And then da -da -da -da, going down the bottom, what are the actual real requirements for an incursion? That's our job. We come to schools and if you're a homeschooling group uh, in community centers and similar places as well. Uh, so that's sort of a really quick way to find programs. Um, otherwise, you, just, you simply just go into the primary science area and go page by page by page and find all the, all the good stuff. I do also want to briefly show you the online resources that are completely free that will keep you going for a very, very long time. So again, if I click on where it says free, uh, you have the things to choose from. And just for the sake of speeding things up, I've got the tabs open. So if I clicked on 150 free experiments, it takes me to here. Uh, these have all been set up by type. And they're really designed to, be able to help people using simple materials that you can get from the local shops. So considering that we are doing uh, an earth science type of thing, I feel like, feel like, feel like, feel like, what should we do? You know what, uh, Rusty was doing water before. So what if I click on water? So if I take myself to water, it'll take me to the various experiments that are sitting on activities to do with water. Uh, and ooh, here we go. It's pretty clear. There's lots of stuff there. And no matter which pro, uh, one you choose, so let's do shaving cream rain clouds, just because, hey, it's fun and it's visual. It's a nice way to uh, well, you know, start <laughs> talking about precipitation. It'll always have a pit, uh, uh, what you need, a picture of what you need, followed by pictures of what to do, a uh, description of what's actually happening in each thing. And importantly, if we go down the bottom, why does this happen? And critically, variables to test. Uh, every single one of these experiments has been written up uh, by uh, science educators. So we want to make sure it is variable testing. So that is there to use as well. Definitely use the free experiments. There are an absolute heap in there as well. So if I move on, on I'm going to get rid of, going to click over here because sometimes they are a little, uh, yeah. The, the, I'm going to move that out of the way. There you go. The, 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 the share bar on <laughs> Zoom gets in the way sometimes. All right. So. 
Another free area are the podcasts. Less known, but there are over 130 podcasts, uh, and they are with leading educators around Australia and around the world, and it's usually on a particular topic. But the problem is, again, because there's so many of them, it's like, what do you choose? Well, if you sort of slide on down, you can choose by topic, which is a good way to go. Uh, similar deal with the teaching articles. There are actually several hundred teaching articles on here. And again, because they're written up, in fact, one only just got published this morning around VR, that might be, not be what, what you're looking for. So definitely as you slide down, go to where the, the topics are and click on it. So for in this case, if I click on biology, it will only search, uh, go with the, the articles that are tagged biology. Very, very handy, especially when you're dealing with a large site. Now, another thing that can be quite handy and actually incredibly popular on our site. Oh, there you go. There's uh, some biology ones, podcasts, as well as some articles. Uh, if I go to science trivia, again, if you're trying to find these, click on the free resources. You will find all four across the top. If you go to this trivia, there are a heap of tri heaps, of, heaps of trivia. Very popular, uh, <laughs> I've got to say, on our site for sure. Definitely worth going. And yes, there's some geology ones as well. But here's the thing. We want to make sure there's a bit of an interactive sort of session. So uh, if you were there with the water one that Rusty did the, uh, this afternoon, uh, Rusty's going to show you something a little bit different. So uh, Rusty, I might uh, shush up now and let you do your thing. Fantastic. All righty. So yeah, Ben did uh, twist my rubber arm to try and get me to do some more experiments. And um, we're talking about water. So I wanted to talk a bit more about the water cycle and how clouds are formed. So I'm going to do a few different experiments on forming clouds. Uh, one that you may or may not be able to do depending on the equipment you have. And the rest is using fairly simple stuff that you should be able to get at home. So the first thing we're going to do is we've got this thing here. This is a bell jar, which is a type of vacuum chamber. And I can actually suck all the air out of there to create a vacuum and change the pressure. To do the sucking, I've got a vacuum pump. And we're going to create a small cloud on the inside. Now, I've just got some links popping up over my thing. There we go. First thing we need to do is we need to get some hot water. We're going to create some water vapor. Now, normally what happens in the environment is you just have evaporation. Uh, little molecules of water on the surface get enough energy, enough to fly away from the bonds uh, that connect them with the rest of the water molecules, and we get what we call humidity. And so water is all around us all the time. Uh, it's part of the environment. And when we get a change in pressure as we go up higher in the atmosphere or changes of temperature, we can actually get condensation into clouds. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is a little bit of a, a quick cheap way of doing it. I've already given this lots of energy, so it's already hot. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually burn a match and the smoke is gonna form nucleation points for those that condensation to form around. So let's grab this. It's gonna get lots of smoke in there. And we're gonna start sucking all the air out. Now you'll notice already that the clouds are appearing a bit thicker. Let's maybe change my camera so it's a bit closer. Let's go to there. You can already see that we're already getting much more vapor, but as soon as I suck all the air out, we actually get more clouds. So let's let the air back in. Let's do some more. So that changing in pressure is able to cool and heat the environment in there enough to actually condense or to um, evaporate any water that is actually in there. So this one might be a little bit hard for you to do if you don't have access to these bits of equipment, but it's definitely something we can bring out to your school once we're allowed out to schools. The next way I want to show you is how you can kind of make your own pressure chamber a little bit, just using a jar. I've got a nitrile glove here. Uh, this works a little bit better than latex gloves because they tend to tear a little bit easier. Um, I'm going to use a match again for this one as well. So what we do is we pour a bit of hot water in there. 
Burn a match. I'm going to try and get as much smoke as possible in there. And then we pop that in. Pop it over without spilling it all over myself. And then I'm going to grab this. Let's see. Oh. This one is a little bit harder because you're trying to create that vacuum just by pulling this membrane up. So not quite as effective as our first demonstration, but we can still start to see a little bit of cloud. Let me see if I can clear up some of that. And we get a little bit of a change in there. It's very cloudy in there. Now, if I open this up, if I can, go so we can actually have all of that cloud coming out now the next one's a little bit different it's, it's much easier to do uh, but you still need a little bit of equipment for it and it's really really effective i've got a uh, little water rocket that we've got that goes together with a bike pump and you would normally put water in here you would turn it upside down and you would launch it up into the air but this time i've actually put a little bit of isopropyl alcohol in there it's the sort of stuff that you might find for like cleaning glasses or computer screens uh, or in some hand sanitizer type stuff. This is 100% isopropyl. Now, the reason why we're using this is the bonds between those molecules is lower than for water. Uh, it's not as polar, so it evaporates much, much easier. So I don't actually have to boil this to have lots of evaporation and lots of molecules in the air. And instead of just reducing the pressure, I'm going to increase the pressure first. And then you're going to see when this, this pops off the top, what we actually get. So I'm going to hold on to this one and we'll keep on doing this until it goes really quickly. And we get an instant cloud. Now, the reason why we're getting that cloud formation is as any gas expands, it cools down. And so it's enough to actually condense the, the water, uh, the alcohol molecules in this case, or the water molecules in the last two cases. Another thing to bring up in the case of this is how we can actually use uh, things like nanoparticles to seed clouds and cause them to actually rain. So in the last two experiments, I used just smoke particles. Uh, but we actually use uh, nanoparticles of silver iodide to actually um, uh, see clouds and cause them to have rainfall where we want. Thank you so much for those experiments, um, Rusty. And thank you everyone for joining us today, not only for your fabulous feedback from the sessions that we had um, throughout the day and also joining us for the Teacher Professional Development Day. Um, we, I'll be collating all of those links and hopefully in the next hour or so, I'll get that email off to you for the resources that you can use to remember embed some of these um, uh, ideas and activities into your um, lesson plans, but also to really encourage some of your students that have that extra interest um, to be able to go on and continue their learning and their journey as well. Um, because yeah, a lot of us, we started our love of science and earth science when we were students ourselves. Um, so we remember the excitement of being able to get out there, get our hands dirty um, and have some fun. So thank you so much. It's been wonderful to be able to put this event on. So thank you to Geoscience Australia, Sydney Olympic Park, Physics Education, and um, on behalf of Virtual Excursions Australia and Australian Environmental Education, it was great to have you here. And Graham in the background for all of his wonderful tech support throughout the day from Dart Learning. Mm -hmm.